have one thing in memory, then it's easy. Here's your code, you get everything else, okay? Everything else, all the memory that's available is what you get. Super easy to program, plus there's some limitations. I mean, if you only have 4K of memory, then the program can only use 4K of memory. <coughs> now we know if we virtualize this, we can make it look like there's 16K of memory. Did you take the pop quiz? Yes. Awesome. Um, so you can virtualize it so that even though you only have physically 4K of memory, you can make it look like I've got 16K of memory. And you do that by swapping out and swapping back in and all sorts of funky stuff. Uh, that's the simple case. Now we get into a slightly harder case where what if I have two processes in memory, okay? And so now you only get from here to here and the other process gets from here to here. Okay, but we've written the program so that we assume we're starting off at line 100, okay? Um, you know, we did an org 100 in our, in our assembly language or whatever. But if I get moved up here, I'm not at 100. Okay. So what did we do to go ahead and fix it so that you could have a program running down here or up here and not have to actually physically change the code? Yeah, but we actually had a hardware fix for it. We put in two new registers. A base register. Base register, and that would fix it, right? So now we just go ahead and say, oh, I'm jumping to something, you know, 45 into it. Well, if I'm at zero, that's 45 plus zero. If I'm at a thousand, I just had that base register as a thousand. When I jump to 45, what really happens is it, I read in, oh, I'm going to jump to 45. I add the base register to that, so I'm actually going to jump to 1,045. Yay! Base register, we're all cool. I can now have multiple processes running, and each of them think they're running at address zero. Or they may actually be in different places. Well, that buys us something. Now, one of the other things, not only is it this transparency, I mean this illusion of you're the only one in the space, and the space is this big, <clears throat> what was one of the other things other than ease of use? You know, I only I can assume that I'm programming at zero, whether no matter where I actually am, um, that makes programming easier. In addition to the ease of use, what was one of the other properties that we wanted this virtualization to have? Assuming you have two processes in memory, what do you not want this one to do? Be able to interact You don't want to mess with this one, right? Um, so for its protection, you don't want it to be able to read or write to this guy's memory. Well, there's also isolation. What's, what is the idea behind isolation? If this one crashes, we don't want the other one to crash, right? So three of the characteristics we're looking for is ease of use. I don't physically have to have the program know where it is in memory. Operating system takes care of that. Um, we can have protection, so you can't see my data, and I can't see you. And isolation, if you crash, I don't crash. Those are the three things. Now, um, in order to do that, well, first off, you know, we have two processes in memory. How many processes do we have in memory? Well, there's process A, there's process B, and there's the operating system. Right. Um, so really, by default, we always have probably three things in memory at minimum, even though it only looks like there's two. And we can put that operating system at the bottom, we can put it at the top, we can put it RAM, we can put it ROM, we can split it up so that part of the operating system, maybe the device drivers are in ROM and everything else is in RAM. There's lots of different ways to do it. We'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages. But one of the other cool things about that base, I mean, I'm sorry, that's what I was going. Okay, so we had a base register, and that allows us to put it anywhere we want it. What did we have to add in order to get that protection and isolation? The limit register. The limit register. So we've got two registers, a base register and a limit register. So it says, hey, 
you're starting here and you can't go any further than here. So now, when I put you know, process A down here and it tries to access something up here, it's going to be beyond the limit register and we know it's out of bounds. You get the segmentation fault and you're set. <clears throat> All right. So, um, you can also do things like, hey, we're going to divide memory into blocks and each one of them has a, a PSW that says, you know, only if you have the key to that block can you get into that block. But, um, and which sort of allows us to do swapping and stuff like that. Now, if you have a base register and a limit register, and A is up here, and it's got its base register 1,000, and it's limited to 2,000, and you swap that out, and then swap it back in, okay, but when you put it back in, you put it back in at zero. What do you have to do? You have to change your base and your limit. So now you should say, okay, well, let's reset the base at zero and the limit at one. Does that make sense? Now, you think about it. Somebody has to set the base register and the limit register. Who's that going to be? Right. Do you ever want the user to be able to do that? Absolutely not, because then they can start bumping it up and look at other people's code. Uh, All right, so here's the whole thing. We've got program A. It assumes it's at 0 to 28. Program B, 0 to 28. Actually, it's at 0 to 28, 16,388 to whatever that number is up there. We do this by base and limit. All right. Uh, the other nice thing is if we have this virtual address space, we can say, ah, yes, you have from 0 to 16K. Well, if it's on a 4K machine, that's not reasonable, but you can, with, uh, you can basically implement that illusion by swapping memory in and out. Uh, but you have to take care of the mapping for the operating system. We talked about base and limits. We talked about swapping. Now, I think this is about where we've gotten to. So if we have you know, process A, we put it in memory, put it in process B, put it in memory, there's plenty of memory to do that. We put it in process C, we have plenty of memory. A finishes. We have process D come in, and it's like, oh, well, D won't fit in here up at the top. But it will fit in where A was. And then we go in here. Um, if we tried to run process A at this point, at time E, A is not going to fit. Even though there's enough memory. I mean, if we added this memory plus this memory, we don't have enough um, room to put A in there without splitting, right? So, and this is the whole idea of fragmentation. You know, if I take things out, put things in, and put things in, and take things out, eventually, you get to the point where you have lots of little bitty chunks of memory and none of those are big enough to put a whole chunk in. So what's one solution? If you've got lots of processes and lots of little bitty chunks of memory and you want memory to be contiguous, what do you have to do? Let's say we're in this situation right here. And if A has to be contiguous, it has to have this much memory, what would we have to do to B and C in order to get A in there? Sorry, what? We could preempt C, and that would give us enough room. What's the other, another option? Oh, uh, you can't see the mouse. Okay, so yeah, we're, we're trying, we're here at E, okay. and we want to um, put A in here. And A too big to fit in here, too big to fit in here, so what can we do maybe to B and C in order to make this fit? Hmm? Yeah, if we just move B down to here, and we move C down to there, now we've got plenty of room, right? And that's what's called defragmentation. Because if you have lots of little bitty fragments, 
then to move everything in memory down and move it down and move it down, all of a sudden all those fragments are now together, you have a huge chunk of memory. What's the problem with that? It's a lot of extra time. You move every, I mean, you're moving a third of memory, right? So you got to move this down and move this down and move this down, and you got to know where to move it. So you have to keep track of all those you know, empty spaces and how big is everything. And so it's, it's a difficult process. Has anybody ever defragged a disk? How long did it take? Like minutes, hours, oh, hours, hours to defragment a disk. Because basically you're copying every single file on the disk, you're picking it up and moving it over to here. And then with that extra space, now you're picking another one up and moving it over, and then picking another one up and moving it over. <coughs> and you have to update the directories, and you have to update all this other stuff. It's an hours and hours long process for disk. Memory is not as big as a disk, but it's still a long time. So maybe there's a better way. And again, the other thing you could do is you just wait, wait until B goes away, and then you can put A in its uh, place. Unfortunately, I've only got one screen here, but two screens virtually, so I can see that screen, but I can't see it. Um, so we could just wait for B to die. We could kill it, we could wait for it to finish, and then we could do A. But, or we could um, uh, defragment, or what if we could split A into two? We put part of A in the lower one and part of the A in the upper one. So that's the other one. All right. Now, this assumed programs are this big. And you know that they're this big. How many people allocate stuff in the middle of the program? Yeah, I mean. You create an array, you create a file, you create strings. That just grows the length of the program, right? So now what do you do? Right. Well, one thing that people do is they'll sit there and they'll say, okay, well I've got this much memory, and I'm gonna put my program A here, and it may grow, and it may shrink, and it may grow, and it may grow shrink. If I put program B, right here, what happens if I try to grow it too big? We've got a problem, right? So instead of putting program B here, what if I put program B here? And I say, oh, if I ever want to grow A, I grow it down. But if I ever want to grow B, I grow it up. Okay? So then I can go ahead and grow this one up and up and up and up and up and up all the way to here. And then maybe um, finish that routine and I can deallocate it all the way down to here. And this one can grow all the way up to here. And then it deallocates back down to here. So as long as you never get a situation where this one's going to here and this one grows to here, well, now you're out of memory, right? So one of the ideas is, all right, so if we have programs that aren't a set size and they're going to have to grow, how do we deal with that? Well, even before we get into that, let's think about a program. How is it going to grow? What are the two things, the two operations that can cause it to grow? Right, and so typically, how do you do that in C? You want to reserve space for an object. You say how much memory? Off it's a you know it's a size of int, where int's gonna be eight, and so if you have ten ints, it's gonna be eighty bytes that you need to allocate. It'll go and get you eighty bytes. Well, <coughs> let's say we have a function, okay? And we'll just do this in Java for fun. Um, and so you know we have a public static um, void calculate something. And it has some uh, variables in that. So you know, here's our int x, int y, and double z, right? 
So if we call this routine, and um, let's just call it double, or well, let's call it uh, twice. And so it takes x and it takes y, there are parameters coming in. It um, takes two times x plus two times y, and returns it as z. Well, when we call that routine, we have to allocate room for x, we have to allocate room for y, we have to allocate room for z, right? Well, what if twice recursively calls itself? Can we reuse this x, y, and z, or do we have to have a new stack with new x, y's, and z's. We're going to make a new set, right? So basically what happens is when you have your code, okay, the instructions are pretty much fixed. So that room, we know what it, you know, we know the length of the code. So there's the code here. Well, each time you make a procedure call, okay, then we're going to have to allocate whatever memory is in that procedure call. Okay, and so we're going to go ahead and that can increase, and it's you know so maybe I call twice and it recursively calls twice and it recursively calls twice, so I've got three times x, three times y, and three versions of z, and then I get out of x. I mean I get out of twice, so now I can reduce that space. I get out of twice, I can reduce it. I get out of twice again, I can reduce it all the way back to zero. So this stack is going to initially grow and, sh and shrink. Well, in the same way, we could be doing mallocs. Now, if you malloc something and then go into a procedure and get back out of the procedure, is that memory still allocated to you? Yes. Okay. What do you have to do to get rid of that uh, memory? Get free. Get free, right? So, they end up having something called the heap, okay? And that heap can grow and grow and grow and shrink and shrink and shrink and grow and grow and grow. So you've actually got two things within a single program. You've got your code, uh, two things that can change. You've got your code, which is fixed. You've got a stack that can grow with each recursive call. You've got your heap that can grow with each malloc call. As soon as you pop something off the stack, as soon as you exit a procedure, your stack's going to reduce. And as soon as you free, your heap's going to go down. Does that make sense? So this way, way of arranging things allows you to say, hey, um, let's say I've got 1K of code, and I'm going to guess I need uh, maybe about 1K of stack, and maybe 2K of uh, malleable memory. So I can go ahead and allocate a 4K slot for this program to run. And as long as I never allocate more than 3K to a stack, or 3K to the heap, or at least the sum of what's in the stack plus the sum of what's in the heap plus no more than 3K, it works. If I ever try to do more than that, I'm sort of sunk. So that would be a way to do it, right? And so we can go ahead and we can say, hey, um, here's our program A. Obviously, we have the operating system. So, um, we've got our operating system down here. We've got A here, and it's got some room to grow. B's got some room to grow. Or explicitly, we've got the program, we've got our uh, heap, and we've got our stack. And so these things can grow here, these things can grow here, and we're okay. But it's still not the most efficient way of doing things, right? Because I had to go ahead and give it a max size here. And let's say uh, B needed just a little bit more room. Well, there was more room. But because of the way we did it, it can only grow in this region here. It can't use this region down here. The same thing here. This one can only grow here, can't use here. And if this one only used like two bytes, and this one, you know, most of that growable space was never used, then we could have used it up here. So again, this is a way of doing it, but it's not necessarily the best way to do it. All right. So let's actually, okay. How many people are reading the book? So we should be, oh, maybe 
about a, well, probably somewhere at about 140 right now. Um, probably, really, should be to about chapter 17. Um, Let's actually look at a couple of things in Say that double is 64 bits, right? But I forget to do the malloc. What's going to happen when you actually use X? Hmm? It's not going to work, right? Um, so you have to, uh, one of the common errors is forgetting to actually allocate the memory. So you start to run it, you use X, X is pointing up, who knows where, right? And potentially that who knows where might be in your code, or it might be in the middle of a different array in your code, or it might be outside your code. If it's outside your code, the what's going to help you? Well, the base limit register, okay? It's going to say, no, 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 segment error. You're out of your segment. But if you're just simply pointing to another part of your data, you, know, you can be changing x, and it's pointed to the wrong place, may actually change your variable, your array up here, right? And you're overwriting some value, you may not know it. That's one of the, the really bad things is, um, if your program compiles, is it right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, you can have logic error, right? But if your program compiles and it runs on your test data, your one test data set, does that mean the program's right? No, because you can have other data pathways, right? I tested this pathway, but I never tested that pathway. So just because your program runs, compiles, and runs, and runs right, doesn't mean it's correct. And one of the things is, if you do have a pointer that's pointing off in the who knows where, um, when you actually write to something the first time, that who knows where may have been a valid place. It was safe. It overrode a variable that you're not using because you've already used it. Or, um, the next time you run it, it may actually go out of memory and it completely crashes. So, that's a really sort of insidious here. So, always remember the allocation method. Maybe you don't allocate enough memory, okay? So, oftentimes in strings, um, you know, if you've got hello, so you're gonna allocate H-E-L-L-O, -L -O, five things, right? Well, but what if you have to have a character to terminate the string. You really need five plus one. Or maybe when you're allocating strings, they're implemented as you've got your data, but you also have a length of the string as the first character. So you have to allocate not only what you need, but what you need plus the length of the length, right? <coughs> so it's also very common to be off by one when you're allocating your memory, so you don't allocate, <coughs> allocate quite enough memory. And therefore, you go ahead and, hey, I've got my array of 1 to 100, and so I'm going to check each one of those things. If you only allocated 99, then you're going to end up writing past your array, past your allocated area. Um, has anybody ever heard of buffer overflow or buffer, you know, yeah. Um, and that's basically, hey, I've allocated this much, but then when I put my index in, I would point it over here. If the operating system allows you to do that, then um, that's a hole. And that was actually exploited quite often um, by people, you know, writing to their memory right here, but they actually meant, wrote to, you know, they allocated an array of 1 to 10, and then they wrote to a sub 50,000, which meant it was way, way over here, which is in somebody else's process. Um, 
All right, so one problem, forgetting the allocate. Another problem is allocating not enough. Um, another problem is forgetting to initialize it, okay? So I allocated my memory, and I allocated the right amount of memory, but what's in that memory, okay? So if we use our heap over here, and we allocated something, and we put in, um, you know, x, x, y, z, uh, and then we freed it, when we free it, does it actually wipe this area of memory? No, it just puts the pointer back down to here. And so the next time you malloc something, it says, oh, okay, here you go. You need this much, I'll give you that much. What's in there is not necessarily 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. It might be x, y, z, 0, 0, 0, 0. So a lot of people, if they don't initialize their variables, they're never going to get whatever junk happened at the end there. Another the common error. Um, anybody know what calloc is? Malloc, allocates memory. What does calloc do? Exactly. It mallets and then sets everything to zero, okay. which is a nice way to make sure you initialize your variables. Okay. Um, getting to free memory. We talked about memory leak. Um, okay. So you absolutely positively must free your memory. Okay. We allocated x. Um, we malloc something into x. We freed x. What happens if we free it again? Overflow error. It's not good, right? So you don't want to repeatedly free memory, okay? The part of the problem is, <clears throat> let's say we put x, y, z in here, and then we went ahead and freed it, and then we allocated y, so now y points to here, and we moved our heat buffer up to here, if we um, free x again, what do you think it's gonna do? It's gonna move the pointer back down to here. So you basically just did the same thing as if you had free y when you called free x twice. So now, next time somebody mallocs, uh, say z, they're gonna point z up to here, and if you're editing Z, you're actually changing Y. And when you pull Y, because you haven't freed it yet, it's going to get the new value of Z. So you've got two things pointing to the same place. Back. All right, here's another fun one. Um, what if we malloc X, and then um, free Y? We never malloc y. I mean, you can call free with anything, right? Any pointer or any variable. And so you malloc here, and you went to free x, but you actually freed y, you got a problem. Now, so basically, when you're dealing with a system that's going to dynamically allocate and deallocate space, you've got to be really, really careful. And that's again why sometimes people went ahead and said, ah, we're not going to rely on the programmer to do everything right. We're going to do it about the instead. instead. Okay, so um, if that's the API we want, and again, by the way, this was all in, I think, chapter 14. So if you want to review that, read over chapter 14. Okay, so if we want to be able to implement malloc and free, what do we need? What data structure do we need in order to do that? You gotta have a heap, okay? And so how are we gonna implement that heap? Hmm? You can have a stack data structure, <coughs> which basically says, hey, you know, this is where my memory starts. This is the current pointer to the next piece of memory. And when I do a malloc, I go ahead and say, okay, I'm gonna return this address, I'm gonna put my pointer up here. 
And the next time they call a Malik, they're going to say, well, how much? You, know, you send in size of whatever. It says, oh, I have to allocate that much memory, so I'm going to move my pointer over here and give you this address. And so when I free it, I'm going to get the address, right? Oh, well, I can get rid of this piece of memory right here. Well, but if I also have stuff up here, how do I get rid of this little piece right here? Okay? So I guess I could get rid of it and move everything else down, but that's no fun. So if you've got a bunch of things and occasionally you want to take a thing out of the middle, what data structure looks for that? A linked list. A linked list. So what we can actually do is we can say, hey, um, I've got my first malloc, that gave me that one. That points up here, and then my second malloc, and then I ended up doing my third malloc, and then I free this one, all I'm going to do is point this down to here, and I'm okay again, right? So that gets me the, uh, so the malloc part, or the free part. Well, the other part is, well, if this section here is, uh, okay, well, this one was here, and this one was here, and this one was here, but I got rid of this one, and I ended up getting rid of this one, what else do I sort of need to know? I know where everything is. I also need to know where everything isn't, right? Where are all the free spaces? So there's a free space there, there's a free space there, and of course there's all of this. So oftentimes you'll end up with a linked list of things that are allocated and a linked list of the free spaces. Having covered that, we can actually go back to this. Okay. Um, that memory can be reclaimed dynamically. Um, since processes can be placed anywhere, we have to have a mechanism for claiming and freeing up that space. So, and again, there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, you can have a, a list of all the free spaces. Um, one way to do that is they've got a list that says, hey, we're going to describe memory. Or in this case, memory, we've got a process here, we've got this free space there, we've got a process here, a process here, we've got a hole here, 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 and here. So they have a linked list where, again, I'm not on the right screen. So um, we've got a process, we've got a hole, we've got a process, and a process. So we can say, oh, we've got a P that starts at zero. It goes one, two, three, five, five units. And then we've got a hole that starts at five, and the hole is three units. And then the process of uh, starts at eight, goes to six, P, 14. Goes. So you can see now when a process dies, you just take that link out, put its next to the one, the current's next, and boom, you're done. So that's one way of doing it using a linked list. <coughs> Um, again, I'm not going to do this one quite yet. Let's go. creating available space and everything. Can you allow the user level to do that? No, because if I can start messing with somebody else's linked list of three spaces, that's a really bad idea. You don't want me freeing up your memory. So number one, you have to have a privileged mode. So only certain operations can only be handled by the operating system, or maybe even the kernel of the operating system. 
Um, <clears throat> in order to do a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, um, especially the dynamic relocation, so if I take A out and then move it back in, as long as I have that ability to go ahead and set the base and limit registers, then I can move it out of memory and move it back into a different place. Um, we have to have that ability to translate virtual addresses into physical addresses, right? And again, we're doing that with the base and, and uh, bounds register. Um, in order to do that, you have to be able to reset the base and the bound on a particular process. And again, that's not something you want to be able to let the user do. So that's going to be another privilege and instruction. Okay. <clears throat> if you're executing things, can you get interrupted? Obviously. So what you probably want to do is you want to have another privilege instruction to be able to um, handle exceptions. Um, and then, of course, you also want to be able to raise exceptions. So if somebody does try to access something out of bounds, then you can raise that exception, go out of user mode, go into the uh, kernel mode, and then handle that however you're going to handle it. Probably from, by killing the offending process, right? If you start accessing things out of memory, operating systems like that, ah, nope, no more scheduled time for you. I'll you know, segmentation validation, program man execute, or uh, uh, execute. All right, so, and this is the one we're going to do. Hopefully, y'all can read it. So, this is sort of a timeline of what really happens. When you boot, okay, um, you have to load in the operating system, and you sort of have to load the table of where are all the um, exception handling regimes, right? So if you have a, um, you know, divide by zero error, how do you handle that? Well, there's some microcode somewhere over there that handles um, divide by zero. And in order to be able to jump down there, you have to have that table, that trap table, you know, the system call, that says, oh, if you ever get this exception, go over here and handle this one. If you ever get that exception, go over here to this other place and handle that. So you load the operating system, you load the uh, trap table, okay? So the hardware is gonna go ahead and say, all right, um, we've got the system call handlers, we've got the timer handlers loaded, we've got the, lim the illegal memory access, we've got the illegal instruction, blah, 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 blah. So we loaded everything up there, right? So <clears throat> the first thing the scheduler is gonna do is it's gonna say, all right, we're about to put process A in, we better set the timer so it can get interrupted, cause the system trap to come down, and then we can look to see if schedule A, uh, process A can still run, or if we need to switch to the process B. So it's going to start the interrupt timer. It's going to initialize the process table because I mean, when we're first booting, we got to start, we got to pick some process. So maybe we you know, pick the command window, or maybe we'll pick the file explorer, or something to display the desktop. Um, or maybe you've got something that automatically boots up. So it's going to set up the process table. It's going to have to initialize the free list because, you know, hey, we've got this data structure that's going to point to all the memory, but we better initialize it, right? Now, um, so that's at boot. Now when you're in the middle of running and say, hey, process A is ready to go. Well, obviously we have to um, create a process, right? We're going to create a process A which means we have to have a table of all the processes, and that's that table that's going to have the priorities and the, you know, who's in the queue and all that kind of fun stuff. So we allocate the entry in the process table. We've got to allocate the memory for the process, and that's the, you know, like the known stack part and part for the code. Um, we're going to have to set the base and bounds uh, register, because obviously, we're going to pull that in and we're going to put it at some point in memory. Maybe we put it at zero, maybe we put it at 16K, maybe we put it at 64K. Wherever we decide to put it, then we need to go ahead and set the base and bound register, right? Now, um, so in order to do that, we're going to have to restore the registers from A because it could have already been running and we're swapping it out of memory and swapping it back. So as we swap it back into memory, 
we're going to bring its, its uh, execution, its code, its data, its, its uh, stack and key, its base register, its limits register, and more importantly, the IP. You know, what instruction was it currently running, and what were the uh, states of all the uh, registers at the time it got swapped out, right? So we're going to have to go ahead and restore all those registers. Now, and all this has been done in protected mode, right? Now we can use back or switch back into user mode, and we're going to jump to the current IP address or the current uh, instruction point address. At that point, now we're into the um, uh, user space, and so it's going to go ahead and it's going to do its run. It's going to fetch its execution, right, its instruction, and start executing, it, right? But as soon as we fetch the instruction, it may just say, okay, jump to 28. But we know we can't just jump to 28, right? We have to jump to 28 plus the base register. So this is actually a hardware thing. We're gonna go ahead and translate the virtual address and then perform the fetch, right? So they said, hey, I want to fetch instruction at 28. Well, we say, well, okay, we're well, actually just doing a 1,000 plus 28. So it'll go down there, it'll fetch the execution, then we switch back into user mode. It's actually going to execute that instruction, but it's going to be 1,028. Um, again, if it happened to be a um, like, you know, load x or load y, and you know y was or x was 28, let's get converted to 1,028. Well, now we actually have to do load to pull that in. So it's going to go ahead and do that same sort of um, uh, check to make sure that the address is inbound. So it's going to look at the base and the limit. It's going to translate it. It's going to pull in the load, do whatever it needs to do. Now, it's going to keep doing this, fetch, execute, fetch, execute, uh, the cycle that we're used to in Marie. But since now we're in a multiprocessor situation, the timer gets boom, you lost your time. Okay? So we're going to have to move you out. So explicitly, as soon as the timer hits, we have to go back into kernel mode. We're out of user mode, go back into kernel mode. We're going to go ahead and jump to the interrupt handler. And in this case, it's the timer interrupt handler. Um, so we're going to call the switch routine. We're going to go ahead and save all the registers for process A. We're going to save the instruction pointer and the um, you know, MBR, MAR. <coughs> we're going to save its base and limit. Save all that out. We go to the scheduler. Hey, which one's going to go next? Ah, we're going to put B in there next. So that means we have to load in for B, all of its uh, registers, its instruction pointer, and its base and limit. Now, it may not be going in the exact same place that it was, so we may have to alter the base and limit, but that's okay. So we're going to go ahead and call switch, which uh, saves the registers for X, uh, or saves the registers for A, and the process structure, meaning like base and limit, and which instruction is running. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and return for that. Now we're going to have to restore B. So we go ahead and after we've done that, we're going to switch back to user mode. And we're going to jump to the current program counter for B. So we go over here and we start running B and we run B. And it maybe it executes a bad, you know, um, load that's out of memory or out of uh, bounds. So we're going to switch back into the hardware. Hardware's going to say, whoa, 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 this is out of bounds. Go back to the kernel jump to the track handler, the out-of-bounds handler, and the out-of-bounds handler pops back over here and says, oh, well, you did something you shouldn't have, segmentation violation, you're out of here. So it's going to go ahead and kill that process and then go back to the scheduler and say, okay, now, schedule something else, we're going to go back to A. That's basically covering everything we've talked about for like the last two weeks. What doesn't make sense in that? Are there any questions in that table? Which, by the way, this is on page 151. So if you were going to review something, that's an awesome thing to review. Because if you can go all the way down that and go, yeah, yeah, I know, I remember how to do that, and, I would, and it makes sense that you go here, it makes sense that you go here, and this is the user mode, and this is the kernel mode and then we've had to have some hardware to, in order to work for this to work. So we've got some of those traps and some of those you know save and switch and things. If you understand that, you've got a pretty good handle on what we've covered. So any questions, anything that wasn't clear in that part?
Yes. So basically, it's going to be the hardware doing the control for the switching from the user mode to the kernel mode. Like, but the kernel be able to go straight to the user mode? Or does it require like, the hardware to Well, think about it. <clears throat> if you're in the kernel, you're all process, right? And you can't just jump to the user mode because you're in the middle of doing things. You, you've got data structures of your own. You've got the queue of ready processes and the queue of block processes. You don't want to just swap out and let anybody overwrite your message or your uh, memory, right? So you pretty much sort of have to swap yourself out or have to have somebody swap you out, right? And then whenever they're ready to come back to the kernel, they have to swap the kernel back in. Does that make sense? Okay. So, you know, theoretically, I mean, if, you, if you want to think of it at a, at a high level. So, yeah, you need to have the hardware as the one that can swap the kernel out and swap the kernel back in. Does that make sense? Okay. So you're going to have a special hardware call that says, oh, I need to go to user mode. I need to go to kernel mode. And one of the things is, do you want the user to be able to make that call? Or is that going to be a protected call? Now, you can give them APIs to do that. So you can go ahead and have trap APIs. This is, hey, I'm willing to give up my processor time. In other words, wait. I'm going to wait for X. There's a resource I need. I'm going to wait for X. And if it's available, great. If it's not, I'm giving up my time. It will trap down to the kernel. The kernel will say, hmm, OK, yeah, you're blocked. I'm going to put you in the ready, or waiting queue. I'm going to put somebody else in. So there are ways to indirectly call it. You can also divide by zero. But um, you can't directly call and say, hey, I'm going to switch into user mode, or I'm going to switch into kernel mode. So yeah, there is some hardware down there. The base and limit registers, um, and uh, some of these protected mode calls and things like that, um, that will um, help implement some of the things we try to do. They also talk about break. Um, there's some other procedures. All right. <clears throat> All right. The next part is about segmentation. And this is sort of what we talked about earlier, where you've got your heap and your stack. And there's several ways to do that. And I don't think I want to go into that today. I think we've covered enough. So we're going to quit a little early today, but y'all should be, I mean, we talked about everything up to about 160, and we will be talking into, we can talk a little bit about the, so, so you should be up to about 170, right? Um, if you're not, take the weekend, get caught up.